a glass prism. An intense beam of ordinary white light is made to pass through a narrow slit and then through the prism. The result is to spread the white light out into its constituent rainbow of colors. This rainbow pattern is called a spectrum. Think about it. White light enters the prism. What comes out of the prism is colored light. Lots of colors. Where did they come from? They must have been hiding in the white light. White light must be a mixture of many colors. Here we see the spectrum running from violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, to red. Since we see these colors, we call this the spectrum of visible light. The sun emits lots of visible light. The air is transparent to it, so our eyes evolved to work in visible light. But there are many other frequencies of light which our eyes can't detect. Beyond the violet is the ultraviolet. It's just as real, but you need instruments to detect it. Beyond the ultraviolet are the X-rays and then the gamma rays. On the other side of visible light, beyond the red, is the infrared, again real, again invisible. Beyond the infrared are the radio waves. Now this entire range from the gamma rays way over there to the radio waves all the way over here are simply different kinds of light. They differ only in the frequency. They're all useful, by the way, in astronomy. But because of the limitations of our eyes, we have a prejudice, a bias, a chauvinism to this tiny rainbow band of visible light. Now, a spectrum can be used in a simple and elegant way to determine the chemical composition of the atmosphere of some distant planet or star. Different atoms and molecules absorb different frequencies or colors of light. And those absorbed or missing frequencies appear as black lines in the spectrum of the light we receive from the planet or star. Each and every substance has a characteristic fingerprint, a spectral signature, which permits it to be detected over a great distance. As a result, the gases in the atmosphere of Venus at a distance of 60 million kilometers have been determined, their composition has been determined from the Earth. It's amazing to me still. We can tell what a thing is made out of at an enormous distance away without ever touching our eyes can't see in the near-infrared part of the spectrum, but our instruments can. Here's the absorption pattern of lots and lots of carbon dioxide, dark lines in characteristic patterns at specific frequencies. You'd detect a different set of infrared lines if, say, water vapor were present. If Venus were really soaking wet, then you should be able to determine that by finding the pattern of water vapor in its atmosphere. But around 1920, when this experiment was first performed, it was found that the Venus atmosphere seemed to have not a hint, not a smidgen, not a trace of water vapor above the clouds. And so instead of a swampy, soaking wet surface, it was suggested that Venus was bone dry, a desert planet with clouds composed of fine silicate dust. But later, spectroscopic observations revealed the characteristic absorption lines of an enormous amount of carbon dioxide. So some scientists thought there must be lots of carbon compounds on the surface, making this a planet covered with petroleum. Others agreed that the atmosphere was dry, but thought the surface was wet. With all that CO2, it had to be carbonated water. Venus, they thought, was covered with a vast ocean of seltzer. Now, the first hint of the true situation on Venus came not from the visible or the ultraviolet or the infrared part of the spectrum, but from over here in the radio region. We're used to the idea of radio signals from intelligent life, or at least semi-intelligent life, I mean, radio and television stations. But there are all kinds of reasons why natural objects should emit radio waves. One reason is that they're hot. And when, in 1956, Venus was for the first time observed by a radio telescope, the planet was discovered to be emitting radio waves as if it were at an extremely high temperature. But the real demonstration that the surface of Venus was astonishingly hot came when the first spacecraft penetrated the obscuring clouds of Venus and slowly settled on the surface of the nearest planet. <laughs> 